Heavenly Father, we just come before you, God. We thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name. We exalt you. We magnify you, Lord. We thank you for this day, this week, this month, God. We thank you, Lord, for the breath, your breath, God, that is in our bodies, Lord. We just take this moment to say thank you, Holy Spirit. Bless you, Jesus. We just invite you on to tonight's, uh, tonight's gathering, tonight's women's meeting. We pray, Lord, that you would just have your way completely. We pray that you would forgive us, God, of anything in our heart that's not like you, anything that we may have done, said, thought, Lord, um, any iniquity in our heart, God, that we have not repented of, Lord, any pattern, any cycle, God, that we need to give to you, Lord. I pray that you will begin to show us especially after this meeting and even during this meeting, God, begin to reveal things in our hearts that we need to lay down at your feet, that we need to just repent of, Lord, and let go. And God, I just cover this meeting in the blood of Jesus. I cover myself and everyone that's on here, everyone that's going to come on later. Everything that's shared here, God, I cover it in the blood of Jesus. I come against any backlash of the adversary, Lord. I come against any spirit of distraction, Lord. I come against any witchcraft, spells, incantations, anything, Lord, uh, any way that the enemy may try to interrupt this meeting, whether in the natural or in the spirit or both. God, I come against it now in the name of Jesus. And God, we just pray, Lord, that your presence would just dwell among us, God, that you would hover over us, Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord, that uh, we we know that your word says the words two or three are gathered. You are in the midst, God. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We are gathered for you, not for anyone else, God, but for you. We're not gathered just to, you know, talk and have a good time, but we're gathered, Lord, to worship you, Lord, to grow in you, to learn more about you, and to encourage one another in the things of you, Lord. So have your way here, God. We give you the seat of honor tonight, Heavenly Father. Be glorified. Be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. So as I share, the topic for tonight is denying self to follow Jesus. And as I shared in the email, this is like a foundational thing, right? Um, it, the Christian, one of the foundations of the Christian faith is self-denial, right? Denying yourself to follow Jesus. Jesus told his, his disciples, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. And unfortunately, we don't see this preached too much today. Um, I think maybe like 10 years ago, I at least I felt like it was being preached more, but you kind of see like messages about suffering and self-denial and God not necessarily giving you everything you want and doing the will of God and not your will. We don't really see that being preached a lot today. It's more so um, God wants to elevate you or you have to push to become, you know, greater and all these things, which is true. But we've kind of left the foundational things. And I think when you think about a house, when the foundation is not sturdy, everything else that's built on it is going to crumble and that house is going to look lopsided. It's not going to be safe, right? It's, it's not going to be a safe structure. And even as we go into this teaching, we know that we are living stones unto God and he's building up a spiritual house. And if me, right, if if my foundation is not right and I'm trying to build on top of it or, you know, I'm, I'm quote unquote running after God. Even the things that I receive, it won't really take root because my foundation is not well. So um, perhaps as the, as the Lord leads, we, we might go into other foundational things in future meetings. But this is a topic that he brought to my heart. So some of the questions are, do you love God more than anything, right? Uh, more than anything, he asks you to lay down. In the Christian faith, we know that God is going to ask us to lay things down. Do you love God more than anything? If God doesn't move when you expect him to move, will you still love him? And you can just think about that in your own situation right now or in something that you've been waiting a long time for God to do. If God does not move when you expect him to move, do you still love him? Uh, how do you deny yourself to follow Jesus? Right. I think that's a question that especially if you, you just got saved and you, you're not really sure, how do you deny yourself to follow Jesus? And you can ask yourself that. What are things that I do to deny myself to follow Jesus? In what areas have you learned to lay down your desires for his? If you've been saved for any number of time, whether a few months to a few years to a few decades, right? We should all have areas where we can say, I have mastered laying this thing down. I've, I've even died to this area, right? I believe it was Paul that says, I die daily. I beat my flesh, right? So we should all have areas where we have mastered something, whether it's our mouth, right? Being slick at the mouth, cussing, uh, maybe it's sex before marriage or listening to certain music. 
or just maybe having an attitude, anything. There are some, there are, there should be areas that we have mastered laying our desires down for him. Uh, the next one is what areas require more self-denial? And this is something that God has been highlighting to me personally, right? God will use different situations in your life, different, you know, events that take place, small or great, to either show you you've grown and mastered this area or to show you, you know what, you need to check this. You need to do better here. And then a bonus is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as he shows you areas that you still need to lay down. Amen. 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 So let's go to um, Matthew chapter 16. We're going to go over two passages today. Matthew chapter 16. One second while I just adjust my screen. Okay. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. And as I shared, this is a foundational teaching. And the purpose of this is to strengthen our obedience to Christ, to strengthen our obedience to Christ. Something that I've learned in my own walk is that, you know, God can take you through seasons of learning how to deny yourself, learning how to, you know, say no to your flesh, even burying some, some areas. But then you go through seasons of rest and trust me, it don't feel good. It, it does not feel good, especially when it comes with suffering and persecution. Let's be completely honest. It does not feel good. It's not until after when you see the fruit and you see the glory that you're like, okay, God, thank you. But you go through those seasons, you go through seasons of rest. And then when he tries to circle back to, you know, to, to bring you up higher and denying yourself, sometimes you try to, at least for me, I find myself drawing back like, Lord, I don't want to go through that again. I've been through so much in this walk, I feel like, right? I've been through, I've given up so much, Lord, please don't let it be so hard this time. And sometimes we can get lax in this area, just being honest, being transparent, we can get lax in this area, but this is a foundational truth. This is foundations of the Christian faith. There's no other religion that says to deny yourself, right? All the other religions, it's works or yeah, I think it's just works, right? Either some sort of sacrifice to an idol or, you know, praying to the sun in a certain direction or going to Mecca or whatever. This is the only that I, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, the only religion that I know where you actually have to deny yourself, where he actually wants relationship with you. He actually wants relationship with us. Um, so as I said, even as we get closer to the, to the end times, we're going to need to have this truth solidified in us even more because there are literally people preaching against that suffering. They're preaching against uh, laying down your life. And it's just a matter of, okay, God wants to give you everything you want. We know that Matthew 24, 24 says that if it were possible, speaking of the end times, even the very elect will be fooled. If it were possible, even the very elect will be fooled and they will be fooled because of the desires of their hearts that they did not want to lay down. Amen. So let's go to Matthew 16, uh, 13 to 20. And I'm just going to read it and uh, and go through it. Um, I don't think I'm going to read every single verse because it's a lot, but let's start at verse 13. Uh, in this section, Jesus asked the disciples, he says, um, verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? Uh, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so they said, some say that you are John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said, but who do you say that I am, right? Who do you say that I am? Have you come in contact with Jesus for yourself, not through your pastor, not through your mother or your father? Do you, Have you come to the knowledge and the revelation of who Christ is, right? And then Peter, Simon Peter says in verse 16, he answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered Peter and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. When we have a true encounter with Jesus, when when we get to know him for real, we have a revelation of him for ourselves. It's not based off of what our mother taught us, our father taught us. It's not based off of what we learned in Sunday school. Those are things to help us come to the, to the understanding of the faith. But at some point in each of our lives, we have to have a revelation of who Jesus is for ourselves. We have to know him for ourselves. And then verse 18 says, and I also say to you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, so going down to verse 21, 
It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. So right before this, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? We see that Peter has a revelation of Jesus. And then the next section, Jesus is now telling them, I must suffer many things. There are things that I came on this earth to do. And one of the main things is to die and raise up on the third day, right? This is part of my mission on the earth. And verse 22, here comes Peter, the same one that had the revelation of Jesus. Uh, Peter says, uh, it says in verse 22, then Peter took him aside. He took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. So how is it that Peter has a revelation of who Jesus is? And yet when Jesus starts to talk about suffering, when he starts to talk about denial, when he starts to talk about going on the cross, Peter says, no, far be it from you. I rebuke that in Jesus name. You will never suffer, Jesus. You are the most high God. You are the savior. Why should you suffer? And I think sometimes in our in our walk, we can have that revelation of who Jesus is. But then as he takes us further in him and he begins to tell us what is required of us, when he begins to tell us what the cost is, we begin to act like Peter and draw back. We begin to rebuke the Holy Spirit and say, no, God is, you know, he's the God of all and he, he owns a, a thousand cattle on the hill. Why should I suffer? He can give me anything and do anything. But he did not yet understand that suffering is a part of this gospel. Suffering is a part of this gospel. Now let's go down to verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, uh, continuing on from after uh, Peter rebuked him, he says to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The profound thing about this is that Jesus himself said, deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me. We live in a time where people contest what Paul and Peter said because they weren't Jesus and well, Jesus didn't say this, that, and the other, but it's written here and in the KJV, it's in red. Jesus himself said, if you are going to follow me, you have to deny yourself, you have to take up your cross and then you can follow me, right? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it meaning. If you desire to preserve yourself, right? Jesus says, deny yourself. And you say, no, Jesus, I can't do that. I'm going to preserve myself. I'm going to, you know, live my best life. I'm going to have fun while I'm young. YOLO, you only live once. I'm going to preserve myself. He says, if you try to preserve yourself outside of me, if you try to preserve yourself by living your best life now, you're actually going to lose it in eternity, AKA hell, right? Hell is still real in 2023. And I'm going to keep saying that because people want to stop preaching on hell today, or at least talking about it. And then he says, but whoever loses his life for my sake, meaning denying yourself, letting go of what you want, your desires, your passions, laying that at my feet, you will find your life. That means true life is found at the feet of Jesus. And I'm sure many of us who have come to know Christ for, for real can testify that the life that I lived outside of Christ was nothing compared to the joy, the peace that I have now. It's nothing compared to the spiritual blessings and the, the, the assurance that I have of eternity. True life is found at the feet of Jesus in total surrender. True life begins when we say yes to God. This is a foundational truth. And saying yes to God is not, yes, God, you can bless my life, right? Because there's so many, when I see stuff, I'm just like, Lord, please help the church because we've gone so far. We've gone so far. It's, it just, I know that if it grieves my heart, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I don't even have words to describe the things that I see, especially online. It just shows the state of the church. So many people are saying that they're preaching the word of the Lord, but it's like, but you're drawing people to something else and not Jesus. People are now using God as a ladder to get where they want. People have, have, a, have created a Jesus of their imagination, a Jesus of their desires, a Jesus of their liking. There's no righteousness anymore. There's no truth. 
we make our own truth. If our bishop says A, B, C, D, if our pastor says A, B, C, D, if minister and prophet and evangelist so-and-so says A, B, C, D, because they're well-known and they have followings, they're right. Never mind. Let's open up the word and see what the Bible actually says. This is where we are today. But Jesus said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And again, of course, God wants to bless us. Of course, he wants to use us mightily and take us from where we were to where he wants us to be like, you know, the Christian life is not a life of poverty or anything like that. But the focus should not be on what God can do for us, but on what God is doing in our heart and really on him, on him. So anything or anyone that, that tries to keep you from the cross, that tries to keep you from suffering is being used by Satan. Anytime you sense the Holy Spirit telling you deny yourself in this area and you push back, that is the enemy trying to work through you. That is the enemy trying to work through you. Just like Jesus uh, told uh, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Even though it was Peter talking, he recognized, no, this is Satan speaking. Because imagine if Jesus did not go to the cross. Satan hates mankind, so he definitely didn't want Jesus to come and do what he was supposed to do. That's why uh, that's why there was a genocide when Jesus was a baby. They were trying to kill the Messiah. They were trying to kill the Savior of mankind. Amen? So going on in verse uh, 26, it says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for? for his soul, for the son of man will come in the glory of his father and with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Life is much more than the here and now, right? So when God tells us, deny yourself, when he, you know, instructs us to do certain things and maybe people don't like it or people don't agree, or we're going to be ostracized, or we know that it's going to cause a lot of sacrifice. Remember eternity, the enemy only wants us to see the here and now. Remember eternity. He's literally going to come. And as it says in verse 27, he's going to reward each of us according to our works. What kind of works are you producing? What fruit are you producing? Is it fruits of, of righteousness, the fruit of the spirit? Or fruits of unrighteousness, the fruits of the flesh? Amen. Verse 28, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Amen. And going back to verse 24, where he says, if any man, uh, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I want to define two words there. And when I uh, go into the word and I study, I like to uh, look up the definitions, whether in Greek for the New Testament or in Hebrew for the Old Testament. And of course, sometimes in the English dictionary, because it gives us a better understanding of what it means, right? We know what deny means. We know what follow means, but let's take a deeper dive into those things. Uh, deny in Greek, in the Greek uh, definition, it means to affirm that one has no acquaintance or connection with someone. To forget oneself, that is completely anti-culture, right? This culture says, do you, boo? This culture says, if it doesn't serve you, if it doesn't serve me, then I'm not doing it. If they don't serve me, if it doesn't, like, I'm not doing it. This culture is very self-centered, self-care, self-affirmation, self-this, self-that, right? Everybody needs self-care. Everybody wants a self-life. This statement right here is very anti-culture, so again, it means to uh, to affirm that one has no acquaintance or connection with someone, to forget oneself, to lose sight of oneself and one's own interests, or to side with his party, meaning God's party. So the self that we are to deny here is our flesh. There's a fleshly nature on the inside of us. It doesn't mean that you know you don't uh, groom yourself. It doesn't mean that you walk around looking homeless to look to look righteous, right? That's ridiculous. The self that he's talking about here is the flesh, the desires, the sinful nature that dwells within each of us, right? Romans says they all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, even if you were baptized after you got born, every single one of us have a sin nature. And that's the self that he wants us to let go of. He wants us to now say, I'm no longer acquainted or connected with that old Deborah. I'm no longer connected or acquainted with that old, insert your name, right? I've given up my old self. I've given up, you know, following every single passion and desire that I have. I've given up listening to man. 
And now I'm on the side of Jesus. I'm on his side. So to deny means I'm so in love with and so dedicated to Jesus that I've laid down my interests, right? I've put my interests down to take up his interests. I've uh, I've denied my mind or, or released my mind to put on the mind of Christ. Even in later uh, books, it says, put on Christ. And before that, it talks about putting off all these other things, putting off the, the, the fleshly man and walking in the spirit of Christ. This is what he wants from us. And this is a daily thing. And it doesn't matter how long we've been saved. We have to renew and remind ourselves of these things because Again, foundations, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget the main thing. It's easy to forget the focus. It's easy to get lost in ministry and platform and stages and business and career and children and husbands and marriage. Those things are good and God will give us those things, but it's so easy to forget about something like self-denial, simply listening to Jesus and doing what he says. And then the other word that I want to define here is follow. Follow. In the Greek, it means to follow one who proceeds, meaning he goes before us. He's the one that leads the way, not me. He says, he calls the shots, not me. So think about your life. Think about your situation. Maybe there's something you're going through. <clears throat> Even if it's something that you're worried about and you're seeking God about, remember, he leads the way. He calls the shots. You may have planned and, you know, did your due diligence, whether it's applied for a job or maybe you have something uh, for school coming up, a test, let him lead the way. Remember, he cares about you, right? Uh, I believe it's in First Peter that says, cast your cares and burdens on him for he cares for you. Let him lead. <clears throat> it also means, <clears throat> excuse me, it also means join him as an attendant or accompany him. So to follow Jesus means to join him, to join yourself with him, to become one with him as an attendant, to accompany him. It also means to join one as a disciple or become or be his disciple. When you think about the disciples, if you even go to earlier chapters, I believe uh, Matthew 4 and the earlier chapters of the gospels where he called them, he called the disciples, they left what they were doing and they now they were they now became part of Jesus's party. They became part of his crew and Jesus was the lead of his disciples. He was the one that said, let's go here, let's go there. He was the one that said, let's take a time of rest. Even if you look at the gospels, there were times where Jesus said, let's go over here. And they would say, Jesus, why would you want to go over there? They want to persecute you or, you know, there's nothing over there. Even uh, I, I, rem I remember the uh, story of the woman at the well, when he went and sat by her, when they found Jesus, they said, Jesus, why are you talking to a Samaritan woman? He leads the way. Sometimes as you're following Jesus, the things that he tells you to do make absolutely no sense. That's why we have to let go of our carnal, our way of thinking, right? What we think is right. It makes no sense whatsoever. It just seems, you know, like, God, what are you doing with my life? Or why are you telling me to do this? Sometimes the things that he will say will make absolutely no sense. But he proceeds. To follow means he goes before you. He leads the way. It's funny how we want God to go before us to, to perform miracles. But when it comes to obedience, when it comes to obedience, when it comes to things that we don't necessarily want to do, we want to tell God what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, right? We want to call the shots. Okay, God, I'll serve you this much. I'll obey this much up until here. But to follow means you follow him 100% fully. And this word applies to me first and foremost. To follow means that we follow him 100%. Amen. So the next passage is Luke chapter 14, which is similar, but there's something in this uh, chapter, in this passage um, that I want to pull out, a few things that I want to pull out. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 33. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 33, and I'm reading in the New King James Version. So verse 25 says, now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, so we see a bunch of people following Jesus. Obviously, he's doing miracles, signs, wonders. He's feeding people miraculously. He's doing wonderful things. And he turned to them and he said in verse 26, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let's pause, let's say la and think on that. Jesus is with a large crowd. They're following after him. I'm sure some of them want to touch him to perform a miracle. And he just pauses. He turns to them and he says, if you really want to follow me, I see y'all following me, but let me tell you what it really requires to follow me. Let me tell you the prerequisite of following me. You got to uh, hate, meaning not, in this definition, hate means to love him more than these things, right? Denying these things more than him. Uh, it means... Uh, he said, you have to hate your father and mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. These are the things that you must sacrifice if you really want to be my disciple. Because I see y'all following me. I know in, in John 6, it talks about the, the 72 that follow Jesus no more. They were, and he said, you follow me because you see, uh, I, I think he said the loaves and the fish. You see the miracles, you see the bread and all that. But let me tell you, in order to follow me, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And they were uh, they were offended. That's a passage in John 6. They were offended that he said this. And I'm sure in this passage, many of them were offended, right? How many of us, God told us to put something down and we are offended. God, how can you ask me to put that down? This is something that I've worked so hard on. Don't you know how long I've desired this thing? But I'm 26 years old. I'm, I, I should be getting married by now. Or I should have this and have that by now. What do you mean? Not now. Or how come you're not talking to me about this thing? How come it's happening for everyone else? We get offended at him when he says, follow me, even though he does not give us what we want at that time. Offended. Some of, some of us, unknowingly, we may be offended right now in our heart because of some things that God has told us to do, whether to pick up or to let go of, or maybe some things that he's shown us in our heart, right? Sometimes he shows us wickedness in our heart. And instead of responding, yes, Lord, you're, you're right. I humble myself. We become offended. Oh no, not me. Surely he's not. You must be talking about somebody else, Lord. I'm gonna I'm a wait and let you tell me who you talking about. Cause it can't be me, right? We become offended at him. And in verse 27, going back to Luke 14, 27, he says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And when you look at this scene, he's pretty much saying, you're following me physically, but your heart is not with me. Jesus, this will preach. You're following me physically, so it seems. Outwardly, you're doing all the things. You're, they're literally following after him. But your heart is not with me. Let me tell you what it takes to really follow me. Let me tell you what it requires to really be on my team. We don't get to decide uh, what God is going to accept. I say that often. We don't get to tell God, okay, God, these are my rules to be in your kingdom. I hope you're okay with that. No, he tells us the rules to be in his kingdom. He calls the shots. Um, I believe it's in first, maybe second Timothy, first or second Timothy, where he says that an athlete must play by the rules in order to win the prize. You don't join a race and tell the, the, the leaders of the race, okay, these are the rules that I think uh, that I'm going to abide by. This is what I can and cannot do. Hope you're okay with that. I'm going to join. No, they're going to tell you, no, ma'am, no, sir, you cannot join this race. These are the rules and you have to abide by that in order to join. These are the rules to be on his team. And this is something we have to remind ourselves daily. I'm telling you, daily, especially as the days get dark, because people are not preaching this anymore. You hardly hear, deny yourself. We see people going to all these conferences, shouting, and they leave with an unrepentant heart. They leave and they go back to sin. Some people don't even know what sin is. Some people don't even know what God requires of them. They don't know what it means to live a righteous life because we're not teaching it anymore. And this is the foundation, foundational truth that we need to go back to. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, then you can follow him, then you can be his disciple. And then verse 28, he says, for which of you intending, and then I want to say another thing, you know, sometimes we can tell ourselves, well, I'm not convicted about that. Well, I don't think that's sin, right? That's the, the, the thing today. I think, I feel. I see, this is how I see it. This is, no, 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 no. When it comes to the word of God, many, many, many things are black and white, right? 
in the word of God. It's, it's, it's plain. It's, it's not a matter of, oh, I'm not convicted. You can't tell God, well, I'm not convicted about having sex outside of marriage, right? And that's an extreme example, but there are some people who don't have the conviction about that. How are you not convicted? When the, the word says in black and white, uh, fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It says that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So let's even check ourselves in the areas that we say, well, this isn't a big deal. There's nothing wrong with this. I don't see it as a big deal. I feel like it's your feelings and the word of God, they don't match up, right? Your feelings cannot contend with the word of God. When we stand before God in heaven and give account for our lives, we can't say, well, God, I didn't feel like that was a big deal. My God, standing before almighty God, the ancient of days and saying, I don't, I didn't feel like that was a big deal. And that's what we do today. The things that we agree with, right? That we side with. God is watching and he's taking record. Amen. Verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation, right? We talk about a foundational truth of the Christian doctrine. So um, lest after he has laid the foundation and it is not, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. And saying this man began to build and was not able to finish, right? So he's saying, count the cost of being my disciple. No, he's telling them, make sure you are aware that this thing is costly. It's not enough to just follow me with your feet in the physical, right? Going back to the, the, the scene with the crowd following him. They're following him physically, but he's saying there's a cost to this thing. It's costly, Nowadays, we just think, well, Jesus paid the price and that's it. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, present your body as a living sacrifice. There's something that you have to give. You have a part to play in it. Christianity is not just bubbles and, and, and rainbow and flowers. You have a part to play. He requires something of you. God says, I sent my son to give his life for you. What have you given me? And the thing that he wants is your life. It's costly. Have we counted the cost? Even in the midst of the tears, are we going to say, yes, Lord, you're worth it? Even in the midst of being under, misunderstood and ostracized and persecuted, yes, God, you are worth it. I understand that many say that they are Christian, but they are not. So when they come and persecute me, I will stand because you are worth it. This is part of the cost. And I understand also spiritual warfare is part of the cost, which we're going to go to in a few, uh, in a few verses. This is part of the cause. He wants radical and crazy obedience out of us. Have we counted the cost? Amen. Count the cost and don't look back. When you choose to deny yourself and follow Jesus, God begins to build something in you. Just like this, this uh, in verse 28 to 30, he's saying it's like a man who's building a tower. He's building you, Right. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, and coming to him as a living stone, that's you and I, we are living stones, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. Going back to the tower, you say yes to, the, to Christ. He's building you up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. So this house that he's building up is holy. Holiness, another foundational truth, holy priesthood. Without holiness, will no man see the Lord? Clean hands and a pure heart. Be holy as I am holy, right? So he says uh, a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, right? As I said before, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about presenting your body as a living sacrifice. And this chapter here mentions we offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. And then another thing that I just want to point out in these verses in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, he says that you have been rejected by people. So as you're, as you're allowing God to build you, right, as you have counted the cost, as, you, as you've said yes and follow Jesus, and you're allowing him to build you through the day-to-day -day things, through reading the word, fasting, prayer, spending time with the Lord, you're going to be rejected. Even as we talked about at our last meeting, even in the church, 
people in the church will reject you when they have strayed from the truth. This is all a part of counting the cost. Unfortunately, it's very sad when you see people running after God, but then they, they, they veer off. And now you look crazy when really they're the ones that are crazy, right? But people are going to reject you. But it says to God, you are choice and precious in the sight of God. Your obedience, your surrender is precious in the sight of God. You looking crazy to people, you giving up everything to say yes to him is precious in the sight of God. I'm reminded of a, a verse in Psalms that says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's precious. What he's doing in you is precious. You saying, okay, God, I, I repent for texting that. I repent for talking like that. I repent for doing that. I repent for watching that. You saying, okay, God, I'm going to turn the television off and go spend time with you. I'm going to stop listening to this music. I'm going to let go of this boyfriend. It is precious to God. You're offering up to him spiritual sacrifices. Your life is precious. It's going up to him as a sweet smelling aroma. This is what he requires in discipleship. So often we talk about discipleship, but unfortunately in many churches and groups, their so-called discipleship is a, is a membership class about their organization. No, true discipleship is sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning of him, right? He told, he told uh, Martha, Mary has chosen that which is good and everlasting. What have we chosen to just do works in a physical church, which of course we know that we should gather, it's good. To just do works in our heart is far, or are we in true discipleship where we have laid ourselves down at the feet and say, Lord, teach me, Rabbi, teach me. Jesus, I know nothing. I need you to teach me. Even though I've been saved for years, God, I humble myself as a newborn babe, desiring the sincere milk of the word of God. Teach me, oh God. This is discipleship to crave him more and more. That even if you go through stormy seasons, even if you go through the worst seasons, the worst situation, God, I still love you and I cling to you, Father. I want you more than anything. And this, again, this is for me as well. I have to remind myself, God, in all these things and all the wonderful things that you've done, and even the, in the things that I'm still waiting for you to do in my tears, in my pain, trust me, I'm in it with y'all. I'm going through some things and I'm still trusting God. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I love you. Lord, you are more than all these things to me. You are more than all these things to me. Jesus first. Jesus only. He is our only God. Amen. So let's go down to um that second part, verse the last few verses, verse 31, going back to Luke chapter 14, verse 31. And I'm wrapping up. Luke chapter 13, verse 31. It says, and he's giving the second example. The first example was a man building the tower and he didn't count the cost and wasn't able to finish it. Now, verse 31, he says, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So he's saying when you you know, consider the cost. He's saying when you uh, choose to deny yourself and follow me, you cannot be like this king who, who is going to war and yet he doesn't count the cost of what he's going to need. So he's comparing discipleship to going to war. So when you say yes to God, you have been enlisted in the army of the Lord, whether we realize it or not. And we need more teachings on, thank God there are more teachings now on spiritual warfare and things like that. But you've been enlisted in a war and there is an enemy that wants to destroy you. And this is something that we have to be aware of, right? We have to be aware of this. Ephesians 6 uh, 10 to 13 says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? Your enemy is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is not your sister or your brother or that person. No, that's not your enemy. The enemy is using those people often, right? 
uh, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the kingdom of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil and having done all to stand. So he's saying, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, make sure that you are fully aware that you're entering into battle. You're entering into spiritual warfare because there's an army that is coming against you. And you have, when you say yes to Jesus, you pretty much declared in the realms of the spirit, a sound has gone out in the realms of the spirit. So-and-so is now on the Lord's army and they are now against, actively against the enemy. So now you're a target for Satan and his kingdom. So, you know, all the crazy dreams, all the attacks, all the warfare at work or school or whatever, you are in, you have, you have been enlisted in an army and you have an enemy that is actively fighting against you. Count the cost. I know it hurts, right? I know you're tired of all the pain and all the spiritual warfare. Trust me. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, please, please let this thing calm down, right? And thank God he gives us weapons as we read in Ephesians 6. He gives us weapons to fight. But this is part of being a disciple, spiritual warfare, engaging in warfare. Even when you're not engaging the enemy, he's trying to engage you. But thank God he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Thank God that you serve a God that is a conqueror and he's made you more. Uh, you serve a God who is who is uh, the commanding officer of our army and he's made you more than a conqueror. He's made you more than a conqueror to overcome your adversary, Satan. So when you're going through left and right with spiritual warfare, don't be surprised. Jesus said, count the cost, right? He says, count the cost. So just a little encouragement uh, for all of us, right? As we are denying ourselves, as we're looking crazy to the world, as we're even being persecuted by so-called Christians, as we see people falling away and not even realizing it, as we see false doctrine being preached and propagated. And as we cry aloud and spare not, and then we're the ones that look like the, the bad guy, right? The encouragement is strengthen your foundations. Strengthen your foundations. Sometimes we have to go back to the elementary thing. Sometimes, you know, you may not be able to find a message like this on uh, denying yourself, right? A current message, but you got to go back to those scriptures and say, Lord, it's getting tough. Let me go back to the word. Let me go back to, you know, the basics and strengthen myself. Let me go back and strengthen myself. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 says that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. So as we see people exalting everything and everyone above God, above his word, as we see people exalting the words of man and the words of their preacher and pastor above the very word of God, we must strengthen our foundation so that we are not led astray. This is the real reason for this message, denying yourself to follow Jesus. If we don't remind ourselves of these basic, uh, simple truths of the gospel, we will be led away by the many false teachings that are out there. Trust me, the enemy is waiting to captivate you and to take you off. And many don't even realize they're not walking with Jesus anymore. Amen. As we see people saying that they love Jesus, calling themselves Christians, but no self-denial, we must strengthen our foundations. Amen. First John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. So remember that your self-denial is an act of love. Your obedience and your surrender to him is an act of love. And why do we love him? The only way that there is love in our heart for Jesus is because he first loved us. That's why I played that song in the beginning. Because you love me, I'll always love you. Because you laid yourself down, because you shed blood on the cross for me, there's room in me. I have the ability by the Holy Ghost to love you back with my yes, to love me, to love you back with my life. Amen. But we must remember that like I said, he first loved us and he took our place. So what are we willing? Like what, what more can we do but lay down our life? If he gave us everything, he gave us his life, his first, uh, his first and only begotten son, how much more can we give, right? What is it to lay down our life for him? And even in exchange for our life, he gives us everything. He gives us peace. He gives us joy. He gives us a guarantee of eternal life, a beautiful exchange. Amen. He showed us his unfailing and unending love. What are you willing to do for him? Be encouraged. 
he's well worth it. And it, it's going to get tough, right? You're going to cry. You're going to say, God, I don't understand why certain things are, are, are taking place. But remember, he has you covered. He has you covered, even in the situations that you do not understand. He has you covered, even in the midst of the craziest warfare. He has you covered. In 1 John 4, 18, the verse right before that says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torments. But he who fears has been made perfect in love. And the reason I mention that verse is because even in our self-denial, even in our surrender, even in our suffering, we have nothing to be afraid of, right? Scripture says, uh, don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill the body and cast the soul into hell. Man can only do so much to you. They rejected you. They maybe kick you out of their, their clique or, you know, you got fired from a job, you got kicked out of your apartment or whatever the case may be, that's the worst that they could do to you. Even if we become martyrs, the worst they can do is kill our body. But we know to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Fear him who can kill the body and cast the soul into hell. So there is no fear in his perfect love. When you say yes to him, he wraps his arms of love around you. So we don't have to be afraid or fear the things that people are going to say or do or the people that we're going to give up. If you have to give up some people, give up some places, you don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of living a radical life of obedience because we gain everything. We gain true life from him. Amen. 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 So that is uh, the teaching for tonight. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, God. We bless you. Lord, we just exalt you. We magnify your name, God. We thank you for this word tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this reminder. Um, a few weeks ago, you had me to say that a call to repentance is the love of God. So even this call to, to remind, to remember the foundational truth, to remember what your word says, God, it is a it is a, an act of love, God. So we thank you for lavishing your love on, on us tonight, God, for even saving some of us from going down a wrong path in our heart, from going, from following after the ideologies and the theologies of this world's heavenly father. We thank you, Lord, for saving us, God, from going after deception, from being lovers of ourselves, from having itchy ears and, and, and calling good evil and evil good. I pray, Lord, that you would fortify us, oh God. I pray that you would strengthen us, heavenly father. I pray, God, that you would strengthen our foundations tonight. If there's any of us, God, that have become tired of suffering, that have become tired of the process of sanctification, that have become tired of laying down our life before you, God, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our feeble knees even now god only you can strengthen us only you can strengthen us god i pray that you would touch us even as a woman with the issue of blood she touched you and virtue flowed out of you god i pray that as we touch you tonight god as we have listened to this message from you tonight god we pray lord that your virtue would flow god into us god into our spirit heavenly father Touch us, Lord, like only you can. Strengthen us, God. The areas that we need to be strengthened, the areas that we need to be uh, fortified. And if there's any of us that have a faulty foundation, any of us that have been taught things that are not truth, any of us that have been taught things that are anti your word, I pray, Lord, that this message would be like a uh, like a magnifying glass to magnify those areas and that you would uproot those things and rebuild the foundation, uh, re-strengthen the foundation, God. Do whatever you need to do, Lord, to make, to make sure that we are uh, firmly built upon you, upon truth. There's so many versions of Jesus today. There's so many versions of Christianity, so many versions of so-called truth, but truth is a person and his name is Jesus. You said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Any truth that is outside of you is not the truth. So God, we repent even, God, for receiving things that are not of you. We repent for following after the, the dictates of this wicked world. And we follow after you, God. We deny ourselves. We run after you, Lord, and I pray, God, that as we seek you, that you would lavish your love on us even more. Those that feel weary, those that are going through, God, lavish your love on them. Wrap your arms of love around them tonight, Heavenly Father. Remind them that you walk with them. Move in a, a miraculous way that they know it can only be Jesus. God, we bless you. 
And God, I just lift up Heather and Daphne before you, God. You know their situations they've shared tonight, Lord. We pray that you would move mightily in their situation, God. Help Daphne as she's at her new job, Lord. Give her the spiritual tools and the weapons that she needs, God. Cause her eyes to see in the spirit every situation that, she's, that she deals with, God. Give her specific instructions and specific equipment, God, to handle that situation, God, with grace and truth, God. Help her to walk in love, but to also share the truth and to move in truth, Lord, everywhere that's necessary. And we pray for Heather, Lord, that you would just comfort her, God, and strengthen her and give her more patience as she waits for this, uh, for her house to be finished and, and for you to just move again financially with her job. We pray for her house as it's being uh, repaired. We pray, God, that everything will go perfectly. We come against any delay. We come against any accidents or mistakes, God. We pray, Lord, that you would have your angels on guard, even as the workers are working on that house. We bless that home in the name of Jesus. And we pray that it will be an atmosphere filled with the presence and the glory of God, that it will be a place of rest for her, God. Even as she is in that hotel room, Lord, your presence is with her and she can rest even there, God. I speak rest over her now in the name of Jesus, rest over her soul. I pray, God, that you would give her peace that passes all understanding in the name of Jesus that she can rest even as Jesus rested on the boat when the storm was going on around him, God. I pray that she would rest. And we thank you in advance for the new job. We thank you in advance, God, for the provision. We thank you, Lord, because we know that you will do it because we've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging bread. Strengthen your daughters tonight, Heavenly Father. We bless you, and I pray that as we leave this meeting, God, that this word and, and your spirit will just continue to minister to us. I pray that none of us will be like those that look upon the perfect law of your word as a mirror and then walk away and forget what they look like. I pray that we will not walk away and forget the word. I pray that none of us will be fraudulent in the spirit that we would not be frauds and, and, and say that we walk with the Lord when really in our private time, we don't walk with you. God, convict us of sin, God. Convict us of unrighteousness, Lord, so that we can walk with you, God, and in you. We bless you. I bless everyone under in this meeting, God. Those that may even has, have had to leave early, those that could not come, I bless everyone in the name of the Lord. I pray that your peace, your mercy, your grace would go with us, God. I saturate us in the blood of Jesus. I pray over our dreams, God, for sweet sleep in the name of Jesus. If anyone is experiencing warfare or attacks in their dreams, I rebuke the enemy off of their dreams now in the name of Jesus. And I speak the peace of God over them. As you, your word says in Psalm 4, 8, that you have given your beloved with sweet sleep and rest. And it is our portion in Jesus' name. We bless you, God. We thank you. And I cover myself in the blood of Jesus against any backlash of the adversary as a result of this message, God. And let there be no backlash to any of us on here, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.